Yo, what's up, everyone? We are back for a third season. We are super excited. Alan, how? What are you doing? I'm sorry. Are you serious? Like we're recording, dude. Listen, I'm reading about you know like the tensions in the Pacific with China threatening to take over Taiwan. You have hmm. in Europe Russia threatening to take over parts or invade the Ukraine. You know the it's, Ukraine. It's Ukraine. No, it's the Ukraine. No, it used to be under the Soviet Union. It was called Ukraine SSR under the Soviet Union. No, no. Well, it's anyway, so Ukraine. you know, it's just a lot of you know our political leaders better know. If- has this ever taken place before? Like something along this lines where the geopolitical stuff is happening? Yeah, in fact, there was, and our leaders could learn from it. Uh, Munich, you know, 1938. Uh, 1938? Yeah. Hitler. That's interesting. And, uh, yeah. Because we're going to be talking to a guy, a historian, an author of a new book just about that time frame, 1938, and Hitler, Germany, all that, all that jazz that our uh, global leaders should be paying attention to. In fact, they probably should be reading this book. You want to talk about it? Let's talk about You know what? Let's talk about the author, too. Hey, speak, how about Have that? a conversation with also, him. Also, welcome back to the show. Uh. Well, welcome back, everyone. Welcome to the third season, the beginning of the third season can you believe we've made it? Huh. Well, you know, the first season was kind of long, you know, but... Yeah, I know. This should be, what, the fifth season by now? It should probably be like six or seven. Yeah. Me. It was... But anyways, let's not live in the past. No. Actually, no. we're going to be going to the past. And isn't that sort of what we do? Well, it we is... We live in the past? Yeah, we are... We, uh, we're not, we're, this isn't the sons of the prophets, you know? We're not looking forward. Man, we are looking back. Cool, but you know what? If you look back, then you can Maybe make judgments. Maybe they could be an offshoot. We should. Sons of the you know, Prophets. May, okay, maybe you should edit that out because we don't want to give other people ideas. Yeah, I know. You know? Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, so. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so third season, yes. <laughs> was your father a prophet? He, you know what? My father was a ordained minister. Um, he was born in the Middle East. That's on, right. My dad right was before, a minister too. Yeah, right, well, right before Christmas. His, we could do it. Sons his of the father, Prophets. father, you know what? My, my, my father, my grandfather, he was, his name was Joseph. His mom was my mom. His ne- mom's name was Mary, you know. And we had a discussion that you know we're from the family of uh, the Virgin Mary, you know her her father, her, so, her father's father. Yeah, yeah, we're we're her related. Mother, her mother we're was related. A <laughs> yeah, my dad and I didn't believe him until I I did some research and he was right. Well, so dad go. Yeah, oh. so uh, maybe my dad was a holy man after all, which would make me the son of a prophet. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, all right, let's. We digressed. Where were we? Way di- digress. Right. Uh, third season, first episode. I'm happy to be back. I'm telling you this. The break, the break. I enjoyed the break. It does me good. It was a nice reprieve. Not so much from doing the show, mm-hmm. but from being from you. Well, yeah. you know. For um, just giving me a couple of months where I just didn't have a constant headache. Well, you know, listen. I For always... This nagging sensation. I've always believed that I should have an impact, you know. I don't want to be someone, you know, where you know where they say where Alan could be in a party and no one would even notice. I I want you to notice. So if my, you know, headaches, or the headaches I created, well, definitely you're definitely noticeable. And you know, desirable. No. So noticeable? that way you'll Absolutely. you'll remember me. So what did you do? What did you do during the break? So we had a couple of months. Um. You know, dating this new girl, and um, I had to help out my mom, so I, I kept myself busy. You know, but work, work really beat the hell out of me, and um, you know. But how other your, than that, how was your Christmas? You know, did you do anything uh, special? Did you hang out with anybody? I, mean, I did go cool? to a uh, I did go to a Christmas party, um, but you know the the whole thing taking care of mom really yeah it took. That beat that the hell out of me too. Cool. Just like pretty work, cool. work and mom, nothing mom happened, and work. Nothing happened on Christmas Eve. Nothing at all. Well, you know, I nope, was. We're done. No, I don't, was. I jogged your memory, and on. I don't even want you to acknowledge it. <laughs> all right. All right. So, so no, yeah, no, so that, no. You, this conversation is. This Christmas conversation Eve. is not going to be. You're welcome. It's not going to be a sop. This is the true. Uh, you know, I had a very good brother. 
and when I mean brother, I mean you know Not family. Really. But someone who's like a brother to me invited me to his <laughs> Christmas. That's sad. That's cr- sad that you forgot about that. Well, you know, I you're pathetic. You're a sick you know, man. All right, here's why. Here's why. If it so, if there was anything bad that happened, I would remember it. But it was it was a good thing. So therefore, but no, uh, Dustin's family. He and Dustin invited me. And he my and mom. Dustin. You're he, really struggling. Ah. Uh, you need to wash it down. Hey, at least people know that I am not. Speaking this is not <laughs> scripted. But no. But on Christmas not. Eve, uh, we, my, my mother and I stayed. There goes my we notes. Breaking everything. My mother and I stayed. Uh, well, not we didn't spend the <laughs> no, night. But, you didn't stay. but we had a wonderful <laughs> evening. Uh, his family, loving, loving family. And you know what? Your father was there, which was great to see him walking around after yeah. after the trying year you had. That's right. He had. Right? He had. He yeah. really had it. It's great to see him walking around. Mm-hmm. Just for those of you who don't know, he was very near death with mm. uh, COVID pneumonia. He was in the hospital. Yeah. Uh, Herman Memorial, uh, to an extent, it's almost like, uh, Herman Memorial, are you doing anything or are you just waiting to watch him die? Anyways, um, he made it. Yeah. He came through. Yeah. And uh, it was truly here a miracle. we are. It was an yeah. absolute miracle. Thank you, Jesus. Um, all right. New show. And mm-hmm. speaking of going back to moments that. You can't remember. How about we go to moments that you can remember with This Week in History? All right. I am going to start off the new season. I'm not even going to ask if you want to go first. I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, Speaking of cognitive tests, anyways, uh, February 10th, 1967, the 25th Amendment is passed. What is the 25th Amendment? Well, under the Trump administration, that was getting threatened a lot by... Oh, Speaker of the House Pelosi. You're like, oh, we need to do the 25th Amendment. You telling me we we you're not going to mention 25th Amendment uh, with this guy, with this president? Who Biden? You know? Yeah. If you can't string two two sentences together, you telling me that you know you can't at least say, hey, let's do a little cognitive test. Let's see what's going on here. I see. Uh, let's see his wife. And Nothing then against the, the guy. No, the, his wife, and then there was another guy that was like, come here, over over here, and then and then they'd grab oh, him, and and they're walking. Yeah. They're, I mean, I was like, one, this is the guy who carries around. I think it's called the football or the whatever the suitcase that launches yeah. the nuclear uh, Air Force One. Right, Jeez. Like on the movie. I mean, come on! I know a lot of people didn't like his tweets, but damn, that guy does, looks like he needs to uh, be walked to the bathroom every morning and night it is and not, afternoon. It is not good. Yeah. Um, and it is interesting that this this week in history is uh, the signing of the Twenty Fifth Amendment. I mean, if you're uh, talking just... about the pens when it comes to Biden, I don't think we're talking about decision making. So. <laughs> no. It all depends. All right, so that's my this week in history. I just wanted to mention that. Throw out a a little bit of a joke, and do you think that maybe the Germans wished that they had a 25th Amendment back in the 1940s? I don't think it would have mattered because they didn't even have a Second Amendment or, you know. <laughs> I think there, <laughs> there's a lot of things I'm sure the Germans had in, uh, in those days. Mm-hmm. Uh, First Amendment, Second Amendment, 25th Amendment, um, yeah. Third, Fourth, Fifth, Sixth. Maybe a Bill of Rights, except now they they time. did they did have a Ninth Amendment uh, about the Volk, you know, power to the Volk, you know, when vote Ein Volk. Let's move on. What's ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. That's what they. That was their motto <laughs> in, the, in those days. <laughs> I wish I knew what you were talking about. Oh no, that was uh, if you look at like some yeah, of what's the. What's the translation? Uh, ein Volk, uh, Volkswagen people, one people, Ein Reich, one power. Ein Führer, one leader. Oh, man. That's, yeah, Volkswagen, the Volk, the people, the folks. Oh, the people's way. Yeah, Ein Volk. Yeah, that's what, that's what that was. But Interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think there was a lot of amendments that, uh, that the Germans wished they had, looking back. But mm-hmm. I don't think it would have mattered because they did not know how to live under democracy back in those no. days. They didn't have democracy. Mm-hmm. That was a new thing. Hell, all of Europe, that was a new and thing. And the guy that we're going to be talking to in a little bit is going to... Let us know that the Germans were pretty gung ho about this guy. Yeah. So, right, yeah. Go on. All right. So mine is going to be um, on this day. Well, uh, on uh, you know on Monday, which is what February the seventh mm-hmm. of nineteen ninety nine, a great man, a great leader passed. His name was uh, King Hussein bin Talal of Jordan. Yeah, he was the King Hussein. Now he had, you know, ups and up and down with this guy. Um, he was uh, 
He was king of Jordan from 52 until 99. He uh, witnessed his grandfather, uh, Abdullah, being assassinated. Um, he was uh, the king during the Six-Day War. He lost uh, East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Uh, he didn't participate in the Yom Kippur War. Um, 1970, he had Black September. Uh, a couple other things, I'm trying to remember all of them, but uh, the, thing, the thing that really stood out about King Hussein, that really made me admire this man. Oh, by the way, the 19, the, I think it was 94, the peace accords, okay. um, when everyone was at the White House, Bill Clinton signing. Uh, the thing that really impressed me about King Hussein was on March the 13th of 1997. Now, there were some tensions between Israel and Jordan. This Jordanian soldier went and murdered seven Israeli schoolgirls and wounded six others. And what did King Hussein do? He, I think he was in Spain at the time. He flew back to Jordan and then went individually to each family member who lost their daughter, got on his knees, and, you know, I don't want to say he begged for forgiveness, but he asked for forgiveness of the parents of every schoolgirl who was killed. Hmm. Man, you know, that's a leader right there. Yeah. I, I was, wow. wow. I was wowed by, by his humility, the way he got down on his knees. Um, now, granted, there's a tradition where yeah, you, you'll have to read about it. I don't want to go into, into all that, but I was just highly impressed. Well, he, he passed away on this day, February 7th, 1999, and his son, Abdullah II, took over, and, and his son is still the king. And that guy impressed the hell out of me when he flew in a fighter jet and bombed uh, the ISIS in Syria. So yeah. anyway, guy, yeah, guy. yeah, very. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, are you done? I am done. All right, Did I do it under two minutes? I don't know. We didn't check, but uh, I think we both accomplished right, that. We right. got probably pretty close. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is This Week in History. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got an awesome guest. He's going to be joining us shortly. His name is Alan Winter. He is the author of the new book, Sins of the Fathers. This is the sequel to Wolf, which is not about a wolf, which is about Hitler and his rise to power. Um, this is what this series is all about, the rise of Hitler um, and the attempt to sort of stop that, bring that to an end. It's a fascinating read, highly detailed, incredibly researched. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen... Alan Winter joins us. Alan, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I, you know, had trouble getting up this morning. Are you kidding me? Right what? Now? What? Not you, Alan. That Alan. You stupid oh. idiot. Hello, Alan. Uh, I'm doing fine, too, and Dustin. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Love, hey, you. Love your name, man. <laughs> it's a wonderful name. That's right. Um, it's great to have you. Um, one... And it's great to have, you know, as, as if it's not uh, great enough to have one Al on the show, I am blessed to have two Alans on the show, and they're both spelled, as you guys said prior uh, to recording, correctly. Yep. Uh, they're spelled correctly. So, um, hey, Alan, so we're really looking forward to discussing uh, your new book, Sins of the Fathers. And my, my first question is really... This is the second installment of the series. The first one was was Wolf, and you you can dive into that. Um, but where did this idea come from uh, to recreate Hitler's rise to power and sort of the attempts to stop it? It came with my co-author, uh, Herb Stern, who's been a friend for about 40 years. And Herb is a litigating attorney. He was a federal judge. He's got an incredible CV. And I was... And he knew that I wrote books and I asked him a question about a lawyer. I wanted to write a, a novel about a lawyer and I had a specific question. And he looked at me and said, you don't want to write about him. You want to write about Hitler. And I looked at him incredulously, this is about six years ago. What, what could you possibly say that hasn't been said about Hitler? There's like a thousand books a day that comes out. I, I come out on the, on the Nazis and Hitler. He said, you'd be surprised. So we had dinner and he started to feed me information and send me articles and books. And he'd been studying this at that time for over 50 years. 
And at one point, Herb was appointed the judge of Berlin by the State Department in a hijacking case. And he actually uh, went to Berlin and, and, and sat, uh, was the judge or presided over a case. So he knew a lot about this. And he said, you'd be shocked at what we don't know. For instance, Hitler was in a mental institution in 1918. The history books don't talk about it. So why not? And we started to go down that road. What didn't the history books say? And the more we uh, delved into this, specifically about Hitler and the Nazis, the more we found the history books glossed over a lot. And then the question was why? But that's how we started this. Well, you know what? Let's answer that question if you guys did come up with a reason, but why? Why did they just gloss over? <sighs> Well, I think part of it is generational. And this I'm talking about the last 30 years of historians that wrote biographies about Hitler and history books about either Hitler or the Nazis or, or World War II. I think the reason is this. There was no easy way that a writer could deal with the atrocities of World War II, how World War II started, which was a bogus way that it started you know, with, with a flag uh, you know, made up incident in Poland that started World War II to the Holocaust. And if you wrote anything that humanized Hitler, the historians, and this is what we surmised, that the historians would feel that they would be absolutely castigated for showing that Hitler, I'll use an example, loved children. How could he love children and do what he did or be responsible for what he did? And so we went down this path, book after book after book, and they all said the same thing. Hitler was a, uh, an unhuman, a subhuman, a black hole, um, that he was not capable of being a friend, that he was not capable of loving anyone, that no one was capable of loving him, all of which is untrue. And we go into it in great detail, not in, in the novel, but in our notes. Our his, you know, notes are published online uh, called notesonwolf.com. But I think that's really the answer. No historian wanted to be accused of saying anything nice about Hitler or the Nazis. That's why I, I guess self-censorship comes into play. Um, but, despite, but it's wrong. I mean, in our opinion, it's wrong. It is wrong because, one, it's... It, you, if you utilize that, then you, when you have a megalomaniac or somebody like him come along in the present or in the future, you don't even, you won't even be able to recognize him because you haven't been honest with how you've told the past. That's exactly the point. You're, you're a hundred percent right. And we felt that as we looked at newer publications, came out a year ago, two years ago. They correct it, they didn't correct it. But here's what's interesting. We found all of our information that was written in the 1940s and 1950s through 1976. And I can name some names for you. Uh, John Toland is one, Ralph Binion, um, uh, Ian Colvin. These men wrote the truth. And so if the historian, modern day historians today went back and read those books, they were documented, they were annotated, they were referenced, uh, and it was clear what was going on you know, with Hitler as a man. And um, this, this is a guy who outsmarted everybody, and we needed to show that, as you just said, so that if we're looking for the next megalomaniac that comes along, the next despot, next person that might be responsible for genocide, they lived a normal life. These were not the Jeffrey Dahmers of the world that would burn cats and dissect animals. These were normal people that put their pants on one leg at a time like everybody else and did not appear to be psychopaths. And yet, you know, history proved otherwise. Well, I mean, we can't defeat evil if we don't recognize the fact that there was a humanity to them and certain things did occur in their lives or things that they witnessed which turned them into these sociopaths. You know, when 9-11 uh, when happened, I remember Bush said, well, you know, these are evildoers. Well, okay, the, the people who committed the acts, they committed an act of evil, but in their hearts, 
it wasn't an act of evil. They were doing the will of God. And so how do you have all these people who, you know, like the, the pilot that crashed in Pennsylvania, he, kind of, he came from a loving family, and he was considered a loving guy. Well, what compelled him to fly the plane de- deliberately into a field in, in uh, Pennsylvania? Something, there was something else that was going on, and if you want to prevent stuff such as another 9-11 from happening, you have to understand why. I'm not saying you condone yeah. what they do, but you have to understand why they did what they did so that you can prevent it from happening in the future. No, absolutely. Uh, you, if I may, you, you said something that was interesting where, you know, for the love of their God, they did this. It, it, it has to be noted that Hitler basically, as you know, got rid of organized religion in Germany. He was against the Catholic Church. He would make deals, but he would break all the deals. But the bottom line, if you think about it, is that when the Nazis took over, they banned religion essentially as we know it. They banned any organized praying as we know it. Hitler was elevated to a god, and the Nazism was the new religion. And if you have a nation that begins to look at their leader as godlike, even to the point where you would look at the mass meetings they had, the Cathedral of Lights, where they made it look like a halo surrounding him, they needed to have a better life. And he gave it to them for a long time until the war came. And so it was easy enough for them to straddle the line of morality and ethics and just slip over a little bit. And oh, it's just not so bad because look at all the other good things he's doing. And then he keeps, they build on it. They build on it to the point where they lose their way and, and they lost their way. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if, that's putting it mildly, uh, for sure. Um, it, you know, we had a conversation last um, last season about um, dictators who came along. And, you know, it was the discussion. The book was about five uh, dictators in particular, but all of them had a cult of personality. And the, the fact is, is you do not rise to power and have people follow you, love you. If you are a, as you mentioned, has been in the modern retelling of Hitler, a non-human. Um, and so that's, I, I think that this book, Sins of the Fathers, does a fantastic job of bringing out the humanity of Hitler at the same time saying, you need to have your eyes open, even if they seem like a relatively regular individual. So absolutely. He mesmerized the people as a group, not all of them. Obviously, there were resistors, which is why we wrote the book, because the German resistance uh, was not given enough play in 1938. They certainly the world knows about what happened in 1944 and other incidences, perhaps, but uh, not the one that we wrote about. Um, But, you know, Hitler was magnetic and People fell for him, they swooned. It was almost like Elvis Presley and, and the way they, they, they literally threw themselves at him. The women adored him. Um, people lost it, but they, he also did good things in the beginning. And I don't want to um, in any way glorify him. In no way can I glorify him. But you had what was probably the most intelligent, educated country in the world at the at the end of World War I, at the Great War, brought down to their knees and below by the victors. And they were so crushed and they, they, they couldn't feed themselves, they didn't have jobs. Uh, the repayment of the reparations, as you know, from the Treaty of Versailles, where it was so onerous they couldn't function, so they had runaway inflation. But Hitler solved all that. And in doing that, he gave them all a life again. And that's one of the reasons they almost had a blind following until they couldn't. And that's really why what our book is about. And speaking of speaking of the book, I want to talk about your protagonist. This is um, correct me if I'm saying it incorrectly, but Friedrich Ricard. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. All right. Um, So he's the best friend, the confidant of Hitler. He's also an SS officer. So where did the idea 
of Ricard stem from and is the goal of the series to prove how impossible it is to fend off destiny or fate? <laughs> I'm laughing because I think that is such a phenomenal question. It really is. Uh, and, and, and the fate one I'll get to, but how did we pick him? Again, we needed to have a fly on the wall of Hitler's inner circle. His inner circle didn't betray him. Goebbels, Goring, Himmler, Heydrich, the people that we all know, those names that are the commonplace, they didn't betray who Hitler was. They didn't talk about whether or not he was, uh, his doctor was giving him all these amphetamines and things like that that have come out in recent years that we learned about, or he was a vegetarian or he suffered from flatulence even, which he did. But the, the point is that how were the decisions made to get him and the Nazi party to the point where they could first become rulers of Germany and then literally in a five-year period begin to claw back all of the lands taken away after the Great War, after World War I, solidify Germany, go against the Treaty of Versailles and, and, and start conscription, start building armaments again and become the mightiest army to a point, and I have to qualify that, uh, in, in Europe, uh, how did he do all this? And so we needed a, a, a character that could tell that story. So he is the eyes and ears of the reader. And when he learns about it, the reader learns about it. But importantly, he also, which um, is, the reader has to know, he has no memory. He was in a, uh, the Second Battle of the Marne. He is, uh, blown to bits, he's put together, he's in a coma, and he's a tabula rasa. So he had, doesn't remember his name. He has no family that he's aware of. He has no history that he's aware of. He's not anti-Semitic. He's not anything. The only thing that was determined at the beginning of the book of, of Wolf, which leads into this, is that he could speak German. So he was German. And that he was a soldier on the field, he wasn't French, he wasn't British, etc. That allowed us to tell our story, and that was critical. Now, did we do it because the fate was inevitable and destiny can't be changed? On the contrary, we did it to show that you need to pay attention to events as they occur, and that silence or being neutral is helping the bad people. And that's an important statement. Being neutral is, is not a good thing. Averting the eyes of the Gestapo that's walking by and looking away. Well, it might be good at that moment to save your life, but it's empowering them. So what was critical for our character to do was to realize from good that he thought he saw, he began to realize it wasn't good. And then it was bad and then it became evil. And that he evolved in a way that I would like to think other people would evolve. And clearly the many protagonists who were the German resistors in our book did evolve. And so if anything, I would say that this book is a book of hope that you need to know history. You need to know it clearly so that when it rears its ugly face again, you can do something about it. Now, part of the crux of this book is about England's opportunity to uh, stop Hitler's, you know, dash to take over all these other countries. Um, now, I know in this book it talks about Czechoslovakia. Germany was threatened with war if they invaded a much larger country called Poland. They were threatened by England and France. He invaded anyway, despite the threats. I mean, what? so the question I'm going to ask is, is that would a threat from Chamberlain, do you think it would have stopped him from going into Czechoslovakia? Would it have maybe created a coup? What, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on yes, that? It would have. You think so? And, and, and I mean, they're not totally analogous situations uh, because it was a year, it was separated by a year. And that year is important for a lot of reasons. But um, 
France and Russia had signed a uh, mutual pact to defend Czechoslovakia before 38. And England had always pledged to support France. So in theory, you had France, Russia, and England ready to defend Czechoslovakia. Hitler was smarter and knew that they wouldn't do it. He just knew they wouldn't. Uh, Halifax from England, who was the former secretary, foreign secretary, said, we're not going to do anything about it. But the question is, if Chamberlain spoke up, so we have to backpedal a little bit. The German resistors were the top elite soldiers in the army, the chief of staff, former generals, present generals at that time in 1938. They were the secretary of state, if you will. Uh, the people in the embassies, they were the top clergy. All of these people wanted to create a coup. Where it fell short and why they needed Chamberlain and they needed the British, and they gave up on the French and I can explain that in a moment, but why they needed the British was the second tier officers. Because when Hitler became the Fuhrer in August of 34 on the death of Hindenburg, Remember, Hindenburg died, he was the president of Germany. They, Hitler abolished the office of president. And he put them together with his chancellorship. He then became the Fuhrer. That is actually when the name Fuhrer was applied to him technically. It was in August of 34. He then had a plebiscite where over 90% of the Germans voted for him to be dictator. So now he was voted dictator in August of 1934. But what he did brilliantly for him was he had the entire Wehrmacht, the army, re-pledge an oath not to Germany, but to Hitler. So unlike America, where we pledged to uphold the constitution and the laws of this land, the entire German army pledged to support Hitler. And that was the big problem because the upper tier chief of staff, Beck, Halter, um, they, they uh, Canaris and the, the Abwar, they knew better and they didn't have a pledge to a man. They had it to the country of Germany. But the second tier officers were morally um, conflicted. They knew right from wrong but they also pledged to Hitler. So they felt if they went to Chamberlain and he made a public announcement on the radio and said to Hitler, if you cross the frontier into Czechoslovakia, we will stop you. And they asked him, they sent emissary after emissary and Chamberlain turned them all away. They didn't ask England to fight. They asked them to just say a few words. And those few words would have changed the soldiers that were underneath the leadership and they could have commanded them. They wouldn't have had this moral dilemma of I swore an oath to Hitler. Wait a second, Chamberlain, England, they rule the seas. They're gonna support us. We're gonna support our leaders. We're gonna overthrow Hitler because he's gonna bring us into a war. It's a long answer. You know, it's a long answer to your question, but that's the reason it would have worked at that time. They were committed. The German leaders were committed. If Chamberlain said something, they were going to take him down. Okay, it's interesting you say that. So Russia threatened to defend Czechoslovakia. And you said he would have he would have uh it would have been different because again, uh France and England threatened Germany, don't go into Poland, but this time he had Russia as an ally. They signed a non-aggression pact, I think what, a week before yeah. the 23rd of August. So had Stalin not signed a non-aggression pact, would then the uh, German, would the French-English threat have prevented him from invading Poland? I don't think so. Because when you read Mein Kampf, when you read every speech, and if you are familiar with the Hossbeck Memorandum, which was about the November 5th, 1937 meeting in which Hitler spells all this out, and parenthetically, if uh, there's a new show on Netflix, Munich, based on the book by Robert Harris, and it's called Munich, The Edge of War. It's 1938. It's the same time period that we're talking about. Um, 
he, he meaning Hitler, was against the entire Slavic peoples. For him, that meant all of Eastern Europe, including Russia. He never believed in Russia. He never was going to follow the, the non-aggression pact with Russia long-term. It was a means to an end for him to get a leg into Poland. He was willing to give them you know, the, the Eastern half. Um, he, he was full of hot air on everything that he did. That's basically the bottom line. He, in, in November 5th, and if you're not familiar with it, this is a very important date in, in history because the historians have neglected it. November 5th, he calls in the following people to a meeting, the, the uh, heads of the military, the, the army, the Navy, the Air Force were all complaining that they had a limited amount of steel to build ships and airplanes and armaments. And they couldn't divide it up. This is 37. So just pay attention to the time, if you will. So in 37, they're, they're short of raw materials. So they need a meeting to discuss how to divvy it up. So they have the meeting. And in that, you have a raider from the Navy. You have um, um, Bloomberg from the Army. And, and you have uh, Goring from the Air Force. You've got Norath is brought in, who's the head of foreign state, and say, wait a second, what's he doing here? That's like our secretary of state. Why, why is he here? Then they bring in some other people. And Hitler starts talking about a manifesto, basically, that we are going to expand our borders. We are going to go into Czechoslovakia and create war, and we're going to go into Austria and create war. And this is in November of 37. We're going to enslave the Slavic people. We expect 2 million people to die uh, in Austria and a million people in Czechoslovakia, and that will give us more food. They didn't produce enough food, they mean in Germany. So when you actually get down to the nitty gritty, they didn't have enough food to feed their people at that moment. They didn't have enough supplies to build armaments. They were going to take Inherently, they believed whatever it was. And how different is that the manifest destiny in the United States going westward you know, from the Atlantic to the Pacific in the 19th century? He believed he was going to take all of it. So again, a long answer. He didn't believe that Russia was going to be his ally. He was going to take them and make them slaves. He never intended to work with them. It was just everything he did was for the expediency of the moment for what he needed them for, then he would discard them and go forward. All of that except one person was Mussolini. Mussolini, he was forever grateful for. And that really was the undoing of him in World War II. And we can go there if you want, but that's not in the book. Well, speaking speaking of the book, the, the, the German people do play a significant role um, in the book from their reaction to the Night of the Long Knives, to Kristallnacht, um, to just how they held up Hitler. Now, you you said that you you believe that if Chamberlain would have said something, that a, a coup would have, or they would have been able to stop Hitler. But the German people, they like, and and we've discussed this, you know, while we've been talking, their appreciation for what Hitler had done for the country, pulling them out of, you know, just, as you said, giving them a life again. If the military had attempted a coup, do you think that the way that the German people were reacting and, and doing the things like this crystal knock, like just losing their minds and just is going nuts. Do you think the German people would have allowed that? They would not have allowed it most likely or wouldn't have approved it without an incident. They needed an incident. And the incident was to go into Czechoslovakia. That really was the key to the whole thing. And the army knew this, the heads of the army knew it. And so what they realized is that once the Anschluss with Austria occurred in March of 38. So again, this is a, a narrow or a short amount of time that so much is happening historically. So in March of 38, the Anschluss is the union of Austria with Germany. They've already regained the Rhineland. The Saar Valley is, had a plebiscite and rejoined Germany. 
And now the uh, Austria goes into, Austria had nothing to do with any of this. In other words, part of World War I, Austria and Germany were not connected. But what Hitler was doing is he was reassembling all the Germanic speaking people in Europe under one big flag, if you will, the Nazi flag. And, and so once he went into Austria, he was bulletproof, as you're intimating. He was bulletproof. You could, this guy was godlike, not only in Germany, the rest of the world. I mean, the English as a group adored him. The monarchy liked him. Many people in America liked him a lot. And they realized, though, that he'd done all of this without ever firing a bullet. Napoleon didn't do it. Caesar didn't do it. I mean, whoever you want to look back in history, they had to fight to reassemble lands and things like that. But Hitler didn't. And so when he cast his eyes for Czechoslovakia, at that moment, Czechoslovakia had a stronger army, and this again answers the question before, Dustin. Czechoslovakia had a stronger army than Germany at that moment. They had better defenses at that moment. France had a better army, but France was in political turmoil, almost on the verge of civil war. So you couldn't count on France. Czechoslovakia were well known fighters, they were, they were good. And so he knew he was going to have a fight. He was prepared for the fight. Yeah, he made the deal with Russia, but he knew he was going to have a, a, a fight. And the army military who wanted to have the coup realized it would be the beginning of another great war. It would drag all of Europe down and maybe the rest of the world. But they realized he had to give the orders to invade. And they needed a 48 to 72 hour window. At this point, Holder is chief of staff, Franz Holder. And he has set it up that Hitler has to call him. And he has to say, mobilize the forces. We're invading on such and such a date, the end of September of, of 38. And when the, they actually go to invade, that's when they pull the coup. And they were waiting for that phone call. And I don't want to spoil the book because uh, although most people know historically it didn't happen, but the phone call didn't come. Why? The prime minister of England took a surprise flight to Germany. And, and as they say, the rest is history. But they were waiting. So you're right. If it was just a coup for the sake of a coup, I don't think it would have worked. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is a wonderful book, Sins of the Fathers. You uh, you definitely need to read this book. It is historical fiction, but it is incredibly detailed, uh, historically accurate. A lot of research went into it. You can tell just from the conversation that we're having uh, with the author, Alan Winter. Um, Alan, where can people purchase Sins of the Fathers? Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the places that you buy books. It's available everywhere. All right. Fantastic. Now, I assume that you would encourage people to buy Wolf first. Well, of course, then... <laughs> I, would, I would love them to buy Wolf because they're a continuation. It is a sequel. But we bent over backwards that it's a standalone book. So you can read Sins of the Father first. I know people that are reading that and then going back to Wolf. It works either way. Uh, it, it's one big story, but I would, what I would encourage people to do is read our author's notes. We, we were so um, specific about our research that we wanted to share it, that again, there's about 115 pages on a website called notesonwolf.com, and we were able to put our uh, research notes in Sins of the Father. So there's about 30 or 40 pages of research notes. They're not dry. They are interesting to read. They tell you what happens. And we discovered a lot of things that the historians just they, they glossed over. And, and they're important to know as we discussed. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Well, Alan, thank you again for being on the Sons of History podcast. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, thank you for, for writing this book. We're looking forward to the next one when it comes out. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was really enjoyable. You know, this was a very interesting and enlightening conversation because I wish some of our political leaders of today were here. I hope they watched this. Mm -hmm. Not that they think that they did, but sure would be good for, you know, we should send it to them because this will perhaps teach some of our world leaders 
on how to deal with red China, on how to deal with Russia. You know, you've got Xi and you've got Putin who are threatening uh, two sovereign nations, and I'll say Taiwan is a sovereign nation, um, and then you have the Ukraine, Ukraine, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Um, I think I think our leaders should should and could learn from this. Yeah, um, because it's it's all about history repeating themselves. Yeah, history, but it, you know, diplomacy. Um, what was that? That was book? one of my books. We're going to talk about uh, one of these books. Exactly. So. No, it's um, it's one of those things where. You're able to trace it and you realize how like the geopolitics of everything is very difficult, but there are things that are required and strong leadership is one of those things that is required. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was really the difference in Hitler and Chamberlain. And I think we discussed that. It's like you had Hitler who was, this is what I'm going to do. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it. Uh, I will call, I will be the one calling the bluffs. Mm -hmm. Chamberlain, Chamberlain and, you know, in France and, you know, just these other countries are like, well, you know, we don't know what to do. Like, we just want peace. We're like peace at what cost, yeah. right? It's like, you know, Margaret Macmillan has, has a book uh, and I think it's called, you know, the, the peace to end all peace. Right? It's just like, you know, you have to, sometimes you have to do some things that are, pretty freaking scary and call the other person's bluff and then be like oh well we'll see where the chips fall um so i think it's a very important what's the book book the peace to end all peace i think that's fromkin or fromkin is it yeah. it's not margaret mcmillan i i don't know i know whoever wrote that book uh, europe's last summer also wrote the peace to end all peace so okay. it's fromkin or fromkin but still yeah something to learn from it but you know not learning from your history look at john kennedy in 62 during the october missile crisis yeah. Gun now he August. he was aware he was aware of uh, Munich, but at the same time, you know you don't want to jump the gun and just declare war because he read the Guns of August, mm -hmm. like you just said. Yeah. Um, Margaret Tuchman, is that her name? Barbara Tuchman. Barbara Tuchman. Yeah. Thank you. See, you know we're getting we're there for each other, Thanks, man. Pal. Yeah. Uh, call it even. <laughs> yeah, we'll call it even. <laughs> All right. So you know, but he he read uh, Barbara Tuchman's book, and that also learning from history. He knew mm -hmm. you can't just. Declare war and think, okay, we're going to kick his ass for a few minutes and then it's and over. It'll and it'll be over. Right. You know, yeah, we'll feel yeah, good about it. It doesn't work like, that no. way. So, Especially when you got a bunch of alliances going on, you know. Yeah, it's just, it's not easy and it needs to be understood that, um, it, it needs to be understood that way. Yeah. It's just like you can't just, you know, willy-nilly or just say, oh, we'll just take a step back until it gets really out of hand and then you wind up with a situation like you had in the, the 30s and 40s yeah. you know so. uh, talking with him it, it this conversation could have gone on and on for hours oh yeah I think, absolutely you know yeah. um I, i've always and especially if we'd have been in new york with him in the cabin at eight degrees yeah well yeah well i guess nowhere <laughs> as to long go as he's got eating yeah and food and, and beer yeah you know i mean what's better to do than drink beer when you're at a uh, oh man setting so far yeah but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, not some historical stories, and I, and I mentioned this to him, uh, I don't know if we were recording at the time, but one of my favorite books is by Robert Kennedy um, called 13 Days, and mm -hmm. it talks about, you know, the wheelings and dealings that took place during the October missile crisis. Um, there was, other than when they were shooting at the, the U-2 spy planes, uh, there really wasn't much action, but it was so intriguing, you could not put the book down, mm -hmm. because... The, the drama, the political drama. And, you know, um, his, his book, his book is the same way in regards to what was going on in, um, you know, over Czechoslovakia in 1938. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's a really fascinating book. So, yeah. yeah. So speaking of books, uh, what do you say, book and movie recommendations? Let's go right to it. <laughs> All right, so uh, without a doubt, my book recommendation and probably both of our recommendations is Sins of the Fathers. But we will say, uh, go get Wolf if you yeah. if you can get that. Um, I think it's a little bit longer. Um, it, these are these are not short books. Okay, these are not you know uh, graphic novels. These are actual thoroughly um, researched. Uh, historical fiction novels. Um, and so the first one is Wolf. This one is Sins of the Fathers. And it just travels through the years. I think this is like in between like 34 to 38. Um, and obviously Wolf is before then, a few years uh, prior. 
So yeah, check the, the book out. The author is Alan Winter, and it was also co-written by Herbert Stern. So uh, you can find it wherever you know books are sold. Movie recommendation, I'm going to go with Valkyrie. My man, my guy, I'm the guy, I'm the guy. <laughs> yeah, um, Tom Cruise doing his thing. Valkyrie, this is about the plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler, the plot that does not come to fruition. And then, you know, spoiler alert, they're all killed. Uh, but it is actually a really good movie. And if you've, if you didn't know that this took place, uh, I think this is really important that you do know that there were a lot of Germans, even Germans in the high command that were very much against Hitler and what was going on. So, well, I want to, you know, if, if uh, I'm going to do a, a special book and movie, but for right now on this subject, um, this movie, I've only, until I bought the disc, um, okay, thank God it's in here because I keep moving stuff around. Uh, this came out uh, on TV, I think it was CBS, right around maybe 20 years ago, between 15 to 20 years ago. It's called Hitler, The Rise of Evil. Uh, it's got a lot of famous people in it. Liev Schreiber, Matthew Modine, Peter O'Toole plays, um, oh God, what was this, Hindenburg. He plays President Hindenburg. Uh, now, the guy who plays Hitler is Robert Carlyle. And talk about a guy who looks like Hitler. He kind of does look like Hitler. But this movie, um, Hitler, The Rise of Power, talks about, it shows uh, his days in World War I and then the Beer Hall Putsch, uh, his, his infiltrating the uh, German Workers' Party, and then it metamorph metamorphosized into the Nazi Party. Mm -hmm. um, and then him taking over the Chancellor position and uh you know there matthew modine plays a reporter who's trying to stop him so um it it just it shows the years from world war one up until um his his grip on power and the burning of the reich hmm. reichstag what, yeah, what was the reichstag that? the reichstag when it went up in flames yeah. and how he consolidated power so it's it's pretty entertaining um it's a little you know yeah you know what is that well i mean they they just okay you know the discussion that we had about showing Hitler wasn't just some oh, evil, just, evil, okay, and that's yeah. it. it. You know, there was a side to him that, you know, if you really want to stop yeah. evil... They just have, have him to... as a shadow figure. Right, yeah, and yeah. I, I, it's just an evil guy, he's just evil, that's it. You know, yeah. it wasn't, there's a little bit more to it, a little bit more complicated. So, this will fall under the, let's just make him an evil person and call it a day. Yeah. So, that's the only complaint I had about this movie, so, but it's still, it's still a good movie. Now, um... I want to do a special uh, book and movie uh, review because on January the 16th, uh, a true gentleman, mm -hmm. an officer and a gentleman that we had on our show, uh, passed away January 16th of this year. I think he was, what, 102 years old? Mm -hmm. And we are talking about uh, Brigadier General Charles Edward McGee. Mm -hmm. He was with the Tuskegee Airmen and a finer gentleman I have never met. Man. True, true gentleman. So... Um, if you get the chance, uh, now his, his daughter wrote this book, Charlene McGee Smith, PhD. It's called the Tuskegee Airmen fifth edition, and it is a biography of Charles McGee. So, uh, we do have a video of our interview with him. Yeah. Uh, it took place a few years ago. Um, he was, uh, at, uh, President Trump's last state of the union. He was honored. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was also at, honored at the Super Bowl. I think that same year. Yeah. But he, he went on that day. They promoted him from Colonel to Brigadier, Brigadier General. General. Yeah. So, um, he was a special guest at mm -hmm. the state of the union address and, um, he, he will be missed because we need, we need more men like him. Amen. Um, uh, Red Tails. He, he very much, he loved this movie. Red Tails, it's about uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, I've watched this. I've also seen the uh, the other one with uh, Lawrence Fishburne. It's, I forgot the name of it. I think it's called the Tuskegee Airmen. Yeah, it's called the Tuskegee Airmen. It yeah. ha you know, both of them have Cuba Gooding Jr., both of them, the, mm. other, the, the Tuskegee Airmen and this one. So, But he really liked this movie. And if you, if you get the... Uh, hey. Your dog. <laughs> hey, cut that out. If you get the Blu-ray edition, uh, this also has a special... That George Lucas made about um, it, it was like a, a docudrama on the Tuskegee Airmen. So you have the movie, and then you have the the Lucas directed uh, docudrama. So um, which for the light, it's called Double Victory. Ooh, yeah. So it's get it. 
That's Get my it. That is my double book and movie review of the day. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings our first episode of the third season to a close. Next week, we'll go all the way to ancient China. That's right. Actually, China? our China? China. China. Actually, our guest is um, a professor out in China, and he will actually be giving us a holler mm. uh, while he's there. I believe in Beijing. I so, hope he didn't. Or Shanghai. I hope he two. didn't hear what I just said <laughs> <China>. <laughs> about uh, you know uh, red China and Taiwan and all. Hey man, it is what it is. Yeah. Look, uh, it is what it is. Hey, so, you know it is. This is a free country. <laughs> Well, it still is somewhat. Yeah, in some ways. Until, yeah. uh, so I can say what I feel. You know? Yeah. No, you did good. You Thank did you, good. Sir. Thank you. Thank All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, that is it. Uh, if you don't mind, go check us out on social media. Uh, go check us out on our website. Yeah, we have, uh, let's see, we are on YouTube. Um, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel and tell all your friends and family. Um, now, we also, we're on Facebook. We are on Instagram. So like and Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Now, if for some reason, you know, we get shadow banned or Neil Young has his way with us, uh, we do have our own website. It's called www.thesonsofhistory.com. And I promise you, sexual chocolate and, uh, you know, who's that uh, polka guy? The great... the. John Candy. Yeah, John Candy. And not, not, none of them. They're not going to be able to convince polka, us polka. to get rid of our own no, website. Nothing? So, no? Okay. You know. All right. Well, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, we will talk to you later.